All right, session three. Has anyone had enough yet? Uh, anyone want to quit? No? You do? Oh, come on. You can take this. This is going to be the fun part. This is where we apply the things that we talked about. Uh, you know, I talked about some of the basic concepts of options. Uh, Kevin expounded on that a little bit with some of uh, the basic strategies. Now we're going to take those strategies and, um, and, and apply them into some of the more popular strategies that people trade, income generation, uh, protection, some of the reasons why people trade options. The first, th well, again, first thing we need to do is the standard disclaimer, which I think everyone has seen by now, options involve risks. Get a copy of the ODD. We're not making recommendations or suggestions, simply education. OIC, we're the wonderful people that are here presenting today, teaching you about options, why we use them, the responsible use. Check out our website. Make use of our investor services team. Right? We're very, very proud of the services that we offer, and uh, we certainly hope that you take advantage of it. Now, uh, presentation outline. I'm going to briefly talk about selecting the right strategy. When we trade options, right, uh, we're not just closing our eyes and throwing a dart at the board. We're trying to figure out what it is we want to do and why we want to do it. Once we figure that out, then we're going to look at some of the different strategies that we have. Kevin's going to be talking about income generating strategies. He's going to be talking about the covered call. He's going to be talking about cash secured puts, which I know he just finished up with. Uh, you know, selling puts, it's a, a fantastic fantastic strategy to kind of have in your arsenal. And, and that's really one of the things that you need to do. There are so many strategies out there. If you remember from the first session, I showed a slide that had dozens of different strategies that you can use. You don't have to know all of them. Maybe pick two or three great strategies if the stock's going to go, if you think you're bullish, the stock's going to go up. Two or three strategies if you think the stock's going to go down. Two or three strategies maybe if you think the stock's not going to go anywhere, right? It's going to trade within a range. You don't have to be an expert on everything, but know enough about just a handful of strategies and you know, keep that in your arsenal, keep that in your uh, quiver of arrows, if you will, and become as good as you can about those. So Kevin's going to talk about income generators. I'm going to talk about my favorite thing about options, which is protection. We're going to be looking at the protected put and the options collar. I was speaking with the gentleman earlier about the options collar. Uh, we're definitely going to get into that. And then, again, the Q&A. We promise we will leave time for Q&A. <laughs> so selecting a right strategy. Uh, I spoke to some people earlier about how do you know what to do, how do you know when to do it. And, and you know, really it's, a, it's an individual thing. We can't tell you the best strategy for this or the best strategy for that because we don't know you as an investor. We don't know uh, how sophisticated you may be in investing. We don't know what your risk tolerances are. Okay? Your broker knows that. You know that. So you're really the best source as to what is best for you. But any strategy that you choose is going to start off with the basics. What's your motivation? Why are you trading this? Are you looking to generate income? Are you looking to protect your portfolio? Are you looking to buy stock right, below where it might be trading? Buy it as a discount, as Kevin had mentioned. You know, what is your motivation for doing what you're intending on doing? And what's your objective? Or, or what's your outlook, I should say? Do you think the stock's going to go up? Do you think the stock's going to go down? Do you think it's not going to move? Outlook is, is, outlook is huge. People are always saying, you know, I bought these calls and I'm losing money on them. You know, why am I losing money? Well, you thought the stock was going to go to 50 and it only went to 45. Your outlook was incorrect. It's not the fact that you were bullish, because the stock started at 42. The stock did go the right way that you thought it was going to, but it didn't go as far as you thought it was going to go. It didn't go as far as you thought it was going to go, maybe in the time period that you needed it to go. So your objective, your outlook is paramount with that. Uh, Kevin, uh, strategies, would you have anything to add there? Do you think there's any, um, anything that you think of before trading? So while, while you were talking, I think the, uh, I, I thought in my head about a driving analogy and like, so you need, I need to get here today. And there are a couple of different alternatives to get here. But the first thing I thought about is the, oh, 
See, I find a way to derail this no matter what. <laughs> it's all right. I'll just keep this up, and then I'll go to the other microphone, or I'll be this guy. Um, I knew what my goal was. I got to get to NIU Naperville, right? And then that is the key takeaway. And you back into, all right, then I know that means I need to take 294 to 88. And it's very similar with option strategies. And the fact of the matter is a lot of people don't think about this is where I want to get, and they think I just want to do something. I just want to start driving. And the more you think about here's my destination, then the figuring out the strategy part, there's probably only a couple different alternatives, right? And your wife's is going to be the right one. So that's it. <laughs> I like that. And, and very accurate usually as well. So, you know, so again, income strategies, choosing what you want and why you want it is really the basis uh, of where you've got to start. Once you have that in mind, and like I love Kevin's analogy, you know, where do you want to get to? Then you could figure out the manner or the strategies that you could use to employ to get there. Uh, one plug that I want to do real quick with the OIC website is we have a strategy page where there's almost four dozen uh, different option strategies that you can choose from. And more importantly, there's a strategy screener. You can select options based on your objective. Are you bullish or bearish or neutral? You can select what you think volatility is going to do, whether it's going to increase or decrease. You can select based on your objective. Are you looking to generate income or hedge stock or maybe acquire stock? So you can filter these strategies based on what you want to do, and then it shows you the strategies that will hopefully accomplish that should your outlook be correct. So definitely take a look at that, options, uh, uh, optionseducation.org, our strategies page. And now Kevin's going to talk about some strategies for income generation. Uh, first, I'm going to find something else I can break or screw up. Anybody got ideas? All right. So um, I appreciate the intro, and I also appreciate giving a little macro look at why central banks have done the options industry a great service over the past handful of years by keeping interest rates artificially low. Because income generating strategies have become incredibly, incredibly popular. And that's what I get to talk about. And so they've, they've kind of sold these strategies on our behalf. There are ways, the takeaway here is that you have alternatives as far as when you have risk capital that's appropriate to invest. And your alternatives are, you know, you can buy, you can put it in savings. And historically, that yielded something that was not insulting. And that has not been the case for the past decade. So central banks have willfully incentivized moving the risk appetite out into things like equities, uh, into bonds to the extent, I'll steer away from a, from a fixed income joke, into equities, and then it's, all right, equities are going up. How could I potentially uh, augment my return on, on this thing that I like to own? And the, the takeaway there is I can sell options against them. And the other um, kind of natural lead into that is that when I asked how many people their, their introduction to options was I bought a call or I bought a put, an overwhelming number of hands went up. And over time, the typical path is that people get frustrated with buying options, seeing them decay, and being frustrated, particularly if they get direction right, but it just doesn't happen in time. And so they do the natural thing, which is turn around and say, uh, well, how do I potentially benefit from the fact that this decay happens? And so they combine their baseline comfort with owning something. We tend to be passive along the market, right? You think about a retirement account, you're not a hedge fund. You don't have a whole bunch of short positions offsetting geopolitical risk, right? We all tend to be passive long, and we're, we're accustomed to owning things. Now, if I could only sell something against uh, something that I own to increase my yield, and that's the backdrop of the covered call. So this is just combining two strategies, one that we're uncomfortable with as a beginner, the naked short call, 
And something that most people, when they're introduced to capital markets, become comfortable with, I want to own, and I'm not advocating for it, I just hate XYZ, IBM or GE or Netflix or Nike or Apple or whatever, but I want to potentially set a target to get out, or I want to be able to sell something that potentially boosts my yield on this if nothing happens. So um, the, the strategy combined is a covered call where I'm writing uh, a call contract against an equity that I own. And in order to not be um, net exposed, you need to own 100 shares of the underlying for every one call that you might sell. Okay, so you can't buy a 10 lot of Netflix and sell a call and be comfortable with that because you, are, you have undefined risk. You only have a, 10 shares of stock and you have the obligation to sell 100 shares above. Does that make sense? You need to own 100 shares of the underlying to have the covered call work out because of the leverage inherent in the contract that you're selling. Okay. Our primary goal, thank you, Federal Reserve, is to increase returns. And the way that that happens is that we're bringing in income. When we sell options, we are bringing in a premium. It's the most that we're going to make, but we're bringing in a premium. We are acting a little bit like the insurance company in that the insurance model, which tends to be a really, really good one, if you travel at all or you go downtown, it's not the Sears Tower anymore, right? What's Willis's primary business line? Yes, exactly. That usually dupes most people. Uh, the Aon building. Yeah, insurance. Folksy uh, uh, Warren Buffett, Berkshire's primary line of business. Okay. They tend to sell premium, bring in small amounts of premium consistently, and have something offsetting that risk. That's the insurance model that tends to work well. Now, it doesn't, you can't just do it sporadically and expect the same results, but the, the, the goal is to increase your returns. And your forecast, if you're expressing that with a covered call, is neutral to bullish. Now, there are people, and again, no fault if this is your thinking, where in a different class, I'd be like, all right, you own an underlying and you sell a call. What do you want the underlying to do? And they're like, go down, I sold a call, it'll lose value. No, absolutely not. Your primary risk is in the long stock ETF index position, okay? Your call is bringing in some small amount of premium. It's giving you a bit of a downside cushion over a given time frame. But you have a covered call, you want the stock to go up because those are called high class problems when you have to figure out whether you're going to cover a position or be called away because it reached your target. Um, so like any option seller, I'm collecting a premium, but assuming the obligation that comes alongside that, okay? I write a call, I have assumed the obligation to sell 100 shares of that underlying at a given price on or before a given date. And for that, I get to keep a premium, all right? Does anybody, is anybody lost on that concept? It's covered because I own 100 shares and could deliver against that obligation. There's a whole lot of terminology that kind of can be off-putting, but it's something that you need to understand, like delivery. That sounds, that sounds off-putting. But if you think about the two things, I have the obligation to deliver 100 shares at a given price on or before a given date. Oh, look what I have, 100 shares in my account. I have a covered risk position. Does that make sense? This, the covered call, that long-winded intro where I can't seem to help myself, is uh, often the natural path beyond, as far as the intro to options are concerned, beyond I bought call, I bought put, I am frustrated with not seeing the market do what I needed it to over the time frame. Let me combine what I now understand about option decay with what I am comfortable with already owning something that I believe in for the long haul 
and look at this powerful combination. Okay? Does that make sense? It's like the Bulls didn't win all those titles with just Michael. They had to have Scotty. And you combine those two things, and great things happen. Huh? All right. That's right. The Bulls used to be good. Um, okay. So all uh, domestic equity and ETF options are American style. The likelihood of being uh, assigned early on that is fairly small. The impetus for it would be that the, the underlying pays a dividend. Uh, I can, as an aside, send you a slide on that or give you the, the brief rule of thumb. I get to keep a premium. That's my benefit. And if the stock does nothing, goes higher, goes a little bit higher, moves right to strike, I'm benefiting in two ways. The stock appreciation and that premium losing value over time because of decay. All right? Now... I have the trade-off because in options, there is always some trade-off. In life, that's the case, not just options. But I am foregoing some of the upside. And this, I harp a lot on the psychological motivators behind trading because I think they play a huge role um, and they can get us in trouble. And the trouble here is that people uh, are reluctant to do a covered call because they think, well, I did all this homework, and I really think this, this underlying is going to go from, I'm just picking a number, 50 to 75 in the next couple months. Well, statistically, the likelihood of that is very, very small. And it's much more likely stocks, indexes, individual equities tend to stay re relatively range-bound in the near term, Okay. And so don't fall in love with the upside narrative uh, and, and at the detriment of potentially combining these two things. And even if it does happen, even if it goes up to 75 and you sold a call against that, you have a great problem. You're making money, okay? The goal here is to protect capital and potentially grow it. And this is a way to potentially protect your capital even when the market moves lower because you've given yourself a slight cushion. Now, your break-even price, figuring that stuff out, is exactly the same as before. You add, in this case, if you sell a call, you add the premium to the strike that you sold. So um, in the case of the, I'm long a stock that's 50, I sell a 55 call for $2 in premium, my effective sale price or my expiration break-even price is 57. I add the $2 in premium to the strike price that I sold, okay? Now, if I bought that, that call, I would need the stock to be over 57 to, be, to make any money at expiration. So I'm flipping the script on this thing, and I'm benefiting from a, a potentially range-bound market. Um, I am limiting my downside risk a little bit. My risk is still in the long stock, okay? But I have offset, I have reduced my kind of effective purchase price by whatever premium that I've brought in. So again, stock is 50. I sell a call for $2 in premium. If at expiration the stock is 48, I'm effectively break even there too because I took in $2 in premium and I could do this again, but I have risk every dollar for dollar below 48. So I've reduced my effective purchase price by whatever I've taken in an option premium, but I have significant risk below that. My primary risk in a covered call is the stock moving lower. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Um, Here's the, the same example with more difficult math because we don't have a stock trading at 50. We have it at 52, and we're selling a call at $1.75, uh, a 55 call at $1.75. What's my effective sale price or break even at expiration if I sell a 55 call at $1.75? Say it louder. I heard a lot of, lot of numbers. 50, 25? Wow. All right. Hang on. Oh, my effective purchase price, 
my effective purchase price. All right, you guys are doing math ahead of me, all right? I didn't take the appropriate amount of cold meds this, to, this morning. Um, my effective sale price would be 56 and three quarters, okay? My effective purchase price would be subtracting that premium from the stock price, which would be $50.25. So really, I should just dismiss all of you that answered that question both the right way. The rest of you can stick around. That was a joke. You need to stay here. I like having a good audience. Here and again, I tend to be visual, but the more comfortable you are with when you, when you see an option chain or whatever in front of you and think about a strategy and you can visualize exactly how that thing performs at expiration, the more comfortable you are with putting this whole concept together and, and ideally putting some capital to work, okay? So here's what that looks like. And psychologically, this is what people get fixated on. No, I think the stock is going to 60. Really, you think the stock is going to go up 10% in the next month? That hasn't happened. And again, now we have massive data where you can go back and be like, that hasn't happened in the past five years, but you're probably right. That's going to happen, right? So have realistic expectations about future outcomes. And there's an inordinate amount of data to figure out what's realistic. Um, all right, so I'm assuming an obligation, and I must be prepared for assignment. On the upside, if I'm assigned on my calls, again, high-class problem. The stock has done what I wanted it to. Now, we invariably get questions about, well, Grammy willed me this IBM stock, and I don't want some taxable event, okay? Well, the way to uh, remove an obligation is to cover the call that you, that you sold, to buy it back, okay? So let's just say that we own this stock and we sold an upside call. The stock has done what we wanted. It's a week before expiration and we're $2 through strike. And I don't really want the stock to be called away. How do we remove that obligation that we assume by selling an option? We buy the option back. Okay, and you're likely going to have to pay. It's two dollars in the money. It's got a week to go. You're going to have to pay two dollars plus whatever time premium. So remove that obligation by covering it. In my opinion, people get too wrapped up in the potential for assignment. As far as calls go, the only economic incentive to exercise a call early is to collect a dividend. Okay, so otherwise, you likely have time in advance of expiration to remove that obligation by buying the call back. And don't whine to me about, oh, I had to cover it. Yeah, you made money on the stock all the way up. It did what you wanted to. Understand that you're trying to get to NIU uh, in Naperville. That was your goal. Your goal was for the stock to go up and you were mitigating some risk and generating income, right? Oh, look, I got here. Let's have some fun. That one missed the mark just a little bit. <laughs> all right, so I hinted at this earlier, and I'm doing pretty much all right on time as far as the handoff. So the cash secured put. This type of approach um, utilizes the, the same functionality as far as selling options are concerned in that uh, we have time decay working for us as opposed to against us. And we have, now we would do this on a stock that we wanted to buy on a pullback, okay? So there are alternatives. You can have a limit order in to buy a stock, somebody give me a stock, I'll repeat it for the, for the online audience, that they would be willing to buy if it sold off a bit. All right, welcome to Illinois, John Deere. Um, where's John Deere trading? Okay, but let's just pick one. 135, John Deere is 135. At what point would you be willing to buy it? 100 bucks, if it pulled back... 30, almost 40%, 35%. Okay, 
Now, you could, you have a couple alternatives. That could, of course, happen. You could have in a limit order to buy 100 shares of John Deere at $100. And that could sit in perpetuity if John Deere never goes down to 100. Your alternative is to say, I would be willing to do that. I can look at an option chain. I would be willing to buy it at any point over the next six months. I'm going to go out six month options. I'm going to look at the 100 strike put and I'm going to sell that. And I'm just picking a number because I have no idea. But let's assume that you could take in $4 in premium. Okay, that's where the market is trading. I sell that 100 strike put with six months until expiration. I collect 400 bucks. Now, if John Deere goes to 140, what happens? No, you made 400 bucks. That's what happens. That's what happens. The guy that had in the limit order to buy 100 shares at 100, what happened for him? He's just pissed he didn't buy it at 135 because I knew it was going up, right? But this is inherent discipline. You're getting paid to be wrong. And now the other benefit of a cash secured put. So the, the, the step back takeaway of understanding your risk, you are comfortable with the idea of owning John Deere at 100, right? You need to be comfortable with that potential and you're expressing, you, there are a couple different ways to express it. In this one, you're being paid to be wrong. You're assuming the same risk, actually a little bit less risk, to the extent that you're taking in $4 in premium. So if John Deere sells off 50% over the next six months, and now it's $82 or something, the first alternative had a limit order in to buy it at 100. You get filled, you're long at 100, it's now 82. The cash secured put sold a 100 strike put at $4. Can anybody tell me what their effective purchase price is? $96, thank you. This guy, the, the sit up front, the know-it-alls, I'm just kidding, although I'm sure you, you do know it a lot, but that's very good. So you're getting paid to be wrong in that the difference versus a, a limit order to buy at some given price is that your effective purchase price is your strike price less whatever premium you took in. You're not effectively buying it at 100. You're buying it at 96. So that person is already down less. Now you needed to be willing, and here's where the, the, the head part comes in. It's like, oh, wow, the stock actually sold off that much. But if you had your plan in place and you were comfortable with it, it did exactly what you hoped. You got to buy a stock that you liked on sale. And if it didn't happen, you got paid to be wrong. Okay? You have to, have to, have to be comfortable with the potential that it goes on sale. And I know I'm totally going off I mean, off the script here. But conceptually, markets are, are unusual in a variety of ways. And this is why I'm a believer in behavioral economics. Because people don't respond to incentives in markets the same way we do in, like, consumer goods. If you look at, psychologically, something goes on sale. This is the, the shoes that you were thinking about. I keep going back to the shoes. The shoes that you wanted for 100 bucks are now 80. They're discounted 20%. All right, now I want in. People are typically most excited to buy markets at or near a top. And in February, when they sold off 11%, people panic, right? So we behave differently when equities get discounted 20%. And options kind of have this built-in discipline to allow you to say, no, no, this is exactly what I wanted to happen. I wanted to buy when it, when it got discounted. Does that make some sense? Okay. The, the power of options as far as expressing a market sentiment uh, can be overwhelming in that there's so many different ways to do it. But when you synthesize, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to express. I want to get to this point. The, the number of ways to get there, there'll only be a couple, and you'll figure out the best way to express your sentiment. 
I want to buy stock below the current market price. I think it's going to fall by 10% in the, le in the next two months. How do I express that? Um, all right, I sell one of the 45 strike puts at $2. A $50 stock sells off 10%, it's at 45, right? I've already given you this example, and you're all hopefully a little bit comfortable with it, but you get these takeaways. If I, I could run through these and bore you, but if conceptually you already got it, this is to augment it, right? So it's the same example. We got our 10% pullback, and we need $4,500 in capital. You have to be comfortable with the potential to lose $4,500, because as much as you love XYZ, it's possible to go to zero. I am old enough to remember Enron and WorldCom and Broadcom and Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns and all sorts of companies that weren't supposed to go to zero. And you have to be comfortable with that potential because while it might not be likely, that amount of capital is set aside because it's possible, okay? So again, if there's one takeaway from my off the, rail, off the reservation talk today, it's think first, foremost, about risk. And am I comfortable with that? And now how's the best way to express it, okay? And then when you start dreaming about how it looks like, when you see it very naturally, you're close, if not there already. If you can see how a given strategy plays out, you get it, all right? Or at least that's, that was the case for me. When you understand the terminology, when you understand the risk, and you can visualize exactly how that looks at expiration, you get conceptually how this stuff works. So uh, that essentially is my wrap up. And the, the, the key takeaway here is that you have the potential for large losses. When you're selling options, the most that you can make is what you take in, and the most that you can lose is significantly more than that. But if you come at it from the, I'm comfortable with that. I don't think that XYZ is going to zero, and I am comfortable with $4,500 in risk, and I like the idea of getting paid in the interim. The cash secured put can be a great way to potentially buy something if and when it goes on sale. Um, now I'm handing it off to the more succinct partner. Well, I don't know about that. Possibly less entertaining, certainly, and definitely better looking. Uh, no argument. <laughs> so, you know, Kevin was talking about Enron and Broadcom and WorldCom. I certainly remember those. Now, and he's absolutely right. These aren't companies that we expected to go to zero, but they did. So if you're in a security that is in trouble like this, and believe me, there's you know, certainly several of them out there today, what can you do to save your investment? If you've got, you know, hypothetically, if you've got $10,000 in, in stock in a company that's getting ready to you know, fall out of bed, what can you do to protect that $10,000? You know, there, when it comes to options, when we talk to investors and when we talk to advisors uh, you know, around the country about do you use options, and if not, why? The number one response, well, I should say the number two response. Number one response is they don't know about them. Options are hard, I, I just don't get it. The second most popular answer is because they're risky. Options are so risky, I could lose all my money. Well, yeah, it's possible. You can lose all your money buying stock, too. You can lose more money buying stock, in a sense, because, you know, as Kevin was using an example, if you buy 100 shares of stock at $45, you've got $4,500 worth of risk. You can control that same amount of stock maybe with a couple hundred dollars by buying an option. So you have quite a, a lower uh, amount of capital that you're risking. You can still lose 100% of the 200, but that's a lot less than 4,500, right? So the whole point of what I'm saying is that options can be used to mitigate risk. As opposed to being risky themselves, they can be used to mitigate risk that you have. Um, that's one of the things that I love the most about it is these protection strategies. And the strategy that I think is, is absolutely terrific, I was speaking with a gentleman earlier, is a protective put. And this is one of my favorite quotes. When you can remove risk, do it. When you can't, reduce it. And that's what we can use options for, to reduce or mitigate that risk. 
And what we're going to talk about right now is a protective put. Let's say we've got a stock that is, um, you know, maybe a large part of our portfolio. We've got a, you know, fifty thousand dollars worth of uh, stock in X Y Z, and we've got earnings coming up, or it's a, um, it's a, a, a pharmacy stock, pharmaceutical stock, and we've got a trial, a test trial for some cancer drug that is uh, getting ready to be reported. If that cancer drug fails we're going to lose the majority of our investment. That $50,000 in shares that we got, that stock's going to go from you know, $50 to two. Right? That's a possibility, and I'm just throwing numbers out. If that's the case, you know, we're going to lose a lot of money. But what if we could do a strategy, can we could uh, couple a strategy, couple an option with that stock to allow us to sell those shares should that, uh, should that drug trial, should that fail? Or should that company report bad earnings and the stock falls out of bed? If, if there's a strategy that we can use as a protection, as a what if, uh, that would be great. It's almost like an insurance policy. I know Kevin was talking about earlier getting in an accident. Think about a protective put as an insurance policy because it allows us to sell our stock at a certain price. Right? If you remember when we buy a put, it gives us the right to sell shares. With the protected put, we already have those shares in our pocket. We've already got those shares in our portfolio. So the protected put allows us to sell that stock at that strike price. It's, a, it's the insurance policy. You know, we, we look at it as uh, you've got a car worth, say, $10,000. And uh, you pay a premium every month. You know, when it comes to insurance, the you know, some of the biggest things in our lives we insure. We insure our health. We insure our lives. We insure our cars. We insure our homes. But do we insure our investments? Do we insure our retirement, our portfolio? You know, most of the case, no. And our, our retirement, our portfolio is worth a heck of a lot more than our cars, typically. I mean, I'm driving an eight-year-old car with 85,000 miles on it, which I love. Um, but the point is, it's really not worth that much. You know, I don't really need to insure that car. I mean, I need to, need to insure it if I hit somebody, certainly. But if somebody hits me, you know, it's not going to be that great of a loss. Uh, my re retirement, however, that, is a, that would be a big loss if I lost that. Right? Uh, so I'm going to want to insure what I can. And that's where these protective puts come in. They provide us downside protection against a decrease in the market. All right? And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, how much of that downside protection do we need? If we're looking at a specific stock, are we willing to accept, uh, you know, Kevin was talking about earlier, the market's going to go all over the place. It's going to go up, it's going to go down, it's going to stay the same. But if, the, if our shares start to decline in value, are we just going to go ahead and panic and sell? Well, probably not. You know, we may ride it out a little bit. But how much of that riding are we willing to accept? We were talking in the first presentation that Kenny Rogers song, you know, when do we fold our hand with these shares? When do we go ahead and, and puke them out? When do we go ahead and just sell them? Because if that stock goes down 10%, it's going down 20%. It's going down 30%. It's going to zero. So the question is, where are we comfortable accepting that risk? Where are we comfortable holding on to those shares as they decline versus where are we saying, that's it, I've had enough? I'm folding. And that's where these protective puts. The strike price that we choose is going to determine where we fold our hand, where we sell those shares. And because we're buying an option, right, we retain that right to exercise. We have the right to decide, are we going to sell those shares or not? As an option holder, that's our choice. We are in the driver's seat to always make that decision. If the shares don't get down to where we want to sell them, then we don't. It's just like, you know, with car insurance. If I don't get in an accident, well, I just, you know, lose the premium that I paid for that month or that six months or what have you. Um, I'm glad that I didn't get in an accident. That's not to say that I want to get in an accident, you know, to get my money's worth. I certainly don't want to do that, right? But, uh, you know, with the protected put, we still retain that stock. So if the shares go up, great. We're making, you know, dollar for dollar. We still have that stock. Kevin was talking about a covered call earlier, where the risk is in that long stock position. As the stock falls, so does your, uh, so does your investment. You, you're losing money as the stock falls in a covered call. 
with the protected put, as that stock goes up, your profit increases. You, you, you have that stock. If the stock goes up, great. You keep making money on it. If the stock goes down to your strike price, then you say, you know what? I don't want the stock anymore. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to cut my losses. So that's what a protected put is. And here's an example. We're bullish on the stock. We're long it from $60. It's currently trading 65 right now, but there's an event coming up, uh, uh, a drug trial, um, earnings, you know, so a court ruling, something like that, and we're nervous. We think that the stock, you know, if, if things don't go our way, the stock is going to lose a lot of value. So we go ahead and we buy protected put on it, the $60 strike, and we pay $100. That gives us the right to sell shares at 60. Now, right now, they're trading 65. So we're willing to accept almost a 10% loss on these shares before we say enough is enough. And then, uh, again, uh, for the engineers out there, as Kevin points out, here's our uh, table to show how it works. As the stock goes up above $60, whether it stays at 65 or keeps going beyond that, we're going to make money. As it goes below $60, we now have the choice, right, because we're buying options. We have the choice to sell those shares at $60. Stock goes to 50, no big deal. We sold it at 60. All right, I don't care where the stock goes below 60. It could be an Enron. It could go to zero. I got rid of those shares at $60. You ask anybody who had Enron stock or um, you know, Broadcom or something like that, how they would have loved to have sold at 30. Right? They <laughs> certainly would have been happy to do so. So a protected put is going to do just that. It's going to protect our investment against a downside move in the market. And then uh, you know, here's our, our break-even that we talk about, our maximum loss. I again, we're buying options. Anytime we buy an option, what's the most that we can lose? The premium. I don't care what strategy you do. Anytime you buy an option, the most you can lose is what you put into it. Anytime you sell an option, I know Kevin spoke about this earlier, anytime you sell an option, what's the most you can make? The premium. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, that's the most you can do. So our protected put, here's our first example. Stock goes out, um, you know, the bottom falls out. We go ahead and sell those shares at $60. If the stock finishes above 60, we just let our, our put expire worthless. No big deal. We're out our premium. We live to play another day. If the stock falls out of bed, we're going to go ahead and sell those shares and we protect it ourselves. Now, another great thing about a protected put is it can actually help us lock in a profit literally lock in a profit. We have, here's the stock again, $65. We're long stock from 60, just like in the previous example. We can buy a put, right, a protected put at say 62. What's our example here? Uh, we're buying the 65 strike, okay? We're buying the 65 strike put. So if those shares fall below 65, we've got the right to sell it. We're paying $250 for that put. So effectively, we're selling those shares. If stock drops, what is the effective price that we're selling these shares? Sixty-two and a half. Absolutely, sixty-two and a half. We bought them for sixty dollars. We're long them for sixty. No matter what happens to those shares, if the stock goes up, great. We're going to let the put expire. No big deal. We're out the two hundred fifty dollars that we spent for the put. Our protection, right? That insurance premium. If the stock drops, stock goes to 50, we sell those shares at 62 and a half. We bought them at 60. So no matter where those stock goes, we are guaranteed a $250 profit. All right? That's a great plan. We can't lose. All right? Nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, you don't always get a situation like that in life. So this is our protective put in here, you know, as Kevin had mentioned, it's easier for me to visualize as well. One of the tools that I think is most important for investors is to be able to visualize that profit and loss. Where do I make money? Where do I lose money? At expiration, what happens if the stock finishes here? What happens if it finishes there? Definitely, if you, if you don't have practice graphing these P&L charts, uh, you spend some time on the OIC website, you know, get in touch with us at the desk. We'd be happy to talk you through it. Now, uh, something to think about, obviously, a protected puts, a limited risk, unlimited reward, etc. cetera. Uh, like Kevin, I'm going to zip through because I do want to get to uh, your Q&A, but collars. 
This is a, a strategy that I really want to talk about. There's a gentleman I was speaking with earlier. He's got a situation. He's got an asset. He wants to protect, right, with the protected put that we were just explaining. But the problem with the protected put is you've got to pay for it, right? Uh, just, like, you know, your, uh, just like your car insurance, you've got to pay a premium every month. With a protected put, you've got to pay a premium for that protection. Well, what if you can add the best of both worlds? What if you could get that protection but you don't have to pay for it. It's not going to cost you anything. And that's where this collar comes in. A collar is, is, is as I like to put it, it's the best of both worlds. It's, it's two option strategies. It's the protected put, which we just talked about, but it's also a covered call. And with the covered call, generally, as Kevin had mentioned, you're selling the call against your asset. You're collecting that premium as income. Here, we're using that premium to offset the cost of the protected put. Protected put costs $2. We're selling a call against it that may be costing around $2 or so. So we're getting that protection for free. We're not paying anything out of pocket. Now, depending on the amount of protection that we're looking for, depending on the amount of profit we're willing to give up, if you remember Kevin was talking about with the covered call, is that stock's going to get called away. Your upside profit potential is limited because you're going to lose those shares. Those shares are going to get called away on you. Same thing here with the collar. It's a covered call, so what's going to happen is as the stock goes up to a certain point, those shares are going to get called away on you. So the, the question is going to be, where are you comfortable getting those shares called away? That's going to determine the amount of premium that you receive from that call, and that is going to determine on what is going to offset the cost of the protected put. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, let's, let's look at how it works here. So again, uh, we've got unrealized gains we want to protect. We've got that, we want downside protection against an event, but uh, like the old Midas commercial, we're not going to pay a lot for this muffler. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> to date myself here, uh, sorry about that. Um, but same thing with the protected put. I'm not going to pay a lot for this option. So we're going to sell a call against it. And uh, you know, the, the key benefit here that I like is that protection is paid for by the premium received from the covered call. All right? uh, we're having our cake and eating it too, as they say. So the risk remains in that long stock until the put kicks in. If stock drops, that long put is going to kick in from the protected put. It's going to allow us to sell those shares at that strike price. If the stock rallies, if it goes up, that short call is going to kick in, and likely our stock is going to get called away from us on assignment. If it's anywhere in between the long put and the short call, well, that's going to be our net profit and loss. If it's below where we paid it uh, for the stock, we're going to lose money. If it's above what we paid for it, we're going to make money. And we'll take a look at the example here. Uh, we're long 100 shares of stock, 61 half. We're worried about an event. And uh, we're willing to accept maybe about a 10% decline in our shares. So we're going to go ahead and buy a 55 strike put. And I know these prices seem a little strange. Um, I assure you they are not for uh, illustrative purposes only. This is a legitimate uh, stock that, uh, that I used to construct this scenario. just happens that the price is lined up, uh, which was very fortuitous, as they say. So uh, I bought the 55 strike put. I paid $1.52. I looked to see, because I didn't want to pay a lot for this muffler, I looked to see what strike corresponded to the premium that I paid for that protection. And I found the 65 strike call that if I got a little lucky with the crowd and maybe negotiate a little bit, I could put it in an offer at $1.52 and I'll get filled. My net cost for the strategy, not including commissions and fees from uh, my broker, which by the way, Kevin, I was a broker for 20 years, so I don't uh, appreciate your bad-mouthing my profession and saying I was useless. <laughs> Whiny traders. <laughs> so, so what we've got is, uh, so we put on the strategy for uh, really no cost. And what's going to happen is, you know, a couple scenarios. The stock can close lower than 55. And if that happens, we're simply going to sell those shares at $55. All right, we've limited our losses. We're along the stock from, what, 61 half. So we are going to lose the $6.5. Right, but just like with the car, if I crash my car that's worth 10000 and I've got a $500 deductible, 
I'm only going to get back 9,500. Same thing here. I've got stock worth what, 6,150, and uh, I go ahead and sell those shares at 55. I'm going to, you know, lose that that difference. I'm going to lose that deductible. If shares finish above 65, then that short call is going to kick in. I'm going to get assigned, likely. I'm going to be selling those shares at uh, $65. My profit is going to be the difference between where I'm long stock, 61 half. Where I let those shares go, 65, that's what, three and a half, uh, $350 profit. So this particular strategy, I've got a $350 potential reward. I've got a, uh, what do I say, $550, $650 potential loss. And it's not costing me anything. All right, anywhere in between those two, if it's anywhere between 55 and 65, that's going to determine my profit and loss. At expiration, stock finishes 62 bucks. Both options expire worthless. I've got nothing to worry about. I've made 50 cents on the stock. So that is the collar, and it's one of the most um, it's one of the most popular protection strategies because you know, as I said, people don't necessarily like to pay a lot for protection. Uh, let's go ahead. We've got about what uh, 10 minutes ish. Uh, Kevin, let's go ahead and do a Q and A. Uh, if everyone doesn't mind. Uh, Frank, do you have something from online? And while Frank's pulling up a question, I, again, I just want to encourage everyone to fill out the surveys, if you would. Okay. What is allowed in IRAs? Kevin, are you a pro on that? I know a few, but no. uh, I'm not that. No. Okay, excellent. Uh, one of the things about IRAs is they do not allow short positions. Uh, well, first and foremost, what I would suggest you do is contact your advisor. IRA rules are changing all the time. We are certainly not tax professionals um, or financial advisors to where we are up on the latest news with what is and is not allowed in an IRA. So first and foremost, the, the caveat I would uh, you know, take with a grain of salt with what I'm saying is definitely contact your uh your uh, tax advisor or your broker. That being said, I'm sorry? That being said, some of the things that you can trade in your IRA that I'm sure about are covered calls. All right, anytime you have a, a strategy that is covered, typically they will allow in your, your IRA. Buying calls, you can trade. Buying puts, you can typically trade, although from what I'm understanding, uh, there are some uh, IRAs that are going to be having problems with a, a security that was halted that expired yesterday, and that's going to result in some short positions for clients because the stock isn't currently trading. You cannot have a short stock position in an IRA. So buying puts might be a little bit tricky. Uh, but covered calls, absolutely, and it's probably one of the most popular strategies that uh, they allow in IRAs. Uh, anything else? Anyone else in the crowd? Nobody's so, got a question. We're that good? Yeah, no, we are. Um, not, not bad. But please do fill out to how good we are or relatively not good. Do fill these out because it helps us uh, know where we can improve, areas that we can emphasize, stuff like that. I'm not trying to run you out of the room. Easy with the jackets. Just kidding. Um, but it really does help us tailor future efforts like this. So take just a couple of minutes. I know surveys generally stink, but they help us refine how this goes in the future. And you can uh, take those surveys. You can uh, drop them off with Frank or with Leisha in the front over here, registration. And we still do have time yeah, for Yeah, uh, 10 minutes. I'm questions. assuming somebody's got a question. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, great question. Uh, his question is, and, and it was a, a gentleman that I was speaking with earlier that had the same question, uh, and it's a question that you know, people ask a lot. You know, how do I know what, stra not even what strategy I want to do, but how long do I want to do it for, right? Uh, when it comes to a protected put or the collar, for example, like we were just talking about, you know, the, the old uh, adage, you know, time is money, uh, applies nowhere as great as it does with the options market, okay? So the more time that you're buying with your option, the further out you're going. You know, I know Kevin talked about weeklies and leaps earlier. 
you know, an option expiring in a week is going to be a heck of a lot cheaper than an option expiring two and a half years down the road. When it comes to protection strategies, how long do you need that protection? You know, the gentleman that I was speaking with earlier, there's a, uh, an event, you know, let's say earnings, for example. Earnings are three weeks down the road. Do I need to buy protection for the next six months? Or do I only need protection for the next, you know, maybe three or four weeks until that event, until that earnings event? So, you know, what we often tell people is only buy as much time as you need, all right? Because, again, time is money. If you don't need protection for, you know, six months, don't buy it. If you're thinking, you know, on the flip side, if you're just looking at buying a call and you think that the stock is going to go from here to there in the next 30 days, well, then, you know, do you really want to buy that call uh, for the next 90 or the next 120 days? You know, just buy options, just buy the time that you need is, is what I would certainly suggest. Well, Kevin, anything different? No, I think that was a, a perfectly appropriate question. Go, going back to my analogy, figure out where you're trying to get to, and, and it kind of leads you to likely the correct answer. Am I worried about geopolitical risk over the next year, or am I worried about earnings in Apple next week? Trade options that accurately reflect that. Can I buy a put to protect the downside protection on my call? No. Succinct? But, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to leave it at that. Uh, you, so if I own a call, uh, I am trading directionally, and I want the market to go higher. If I now combine that with buying a put, I have a fancy new strategy called a strangle. Okay. Uh, hopefully, there's no young. Uh, what, what's it called? The microaggressions in the options industry. That's called a strangle. Everybody has to deal with that. Now, the strangle, while the put that you bought um, doesn't offset the risk in the call, it gives you the potential to make money in either direction now. But you have likely Double, at least doubled whatever premium you've taken in. So the answer does, if I buy a put, does that offset the risk? As they frame the question, no. What it does do is combine with the call that you bought, and it says to the market, move in a big way one direction or the other. Because if I go down quite a bit, my put should work out well. If I go up quite a bit, my call will work well but it does not hedge your, your call premium risk, it adds to it. Does that and, make sense? And just to add to okay. that, if it doesn't move at all, then what happens? You've lost the premium that you paid on the call, you've lost the premium that you paid on the put. Right? Now you've got double, uh, well, you've got a double loss in a sense. Okay? So the, the strangle that uh, Kevin's talking about, like he had mentioned, you want big movements. You want it to move up a big way. You want it to move down a big way. You don't care which way, but it needs to move big one way or the other. If it doesn't, that's where you lose. Yes, sir. In a caller strategy, the put and call, the date can move up and down, and the price can be up and down, so there are more variations. Well, uh, the, the question is, with the collar strategy, and, and uh, and let me see if I, I'm understanding this correctly. Uh, can you use different maturities and can you use different strikes? Is that right? Um, you can, but it doesn't afford you the same protection. Typically, a collar is going to be the same month, right? We're doing uh, you know May options. We want to protect against you know with the collar again. You're protecting against something, right? So if you if you have different months then now you've got time risk. You know, something can happen between that month and the, and the other month that you're not protected for. So typically with the collar, it's both the same month, uh, and you typically use out-of-the-money options. In our, you, know, you would use an out-of-the-money put, which is going to have, say, a $45 strike, an out-of-the-money call, which may have a $55 strike. So you've got different strikes, but they are the same month. That's not to say that you can't. You know, the thing about options is you can do whatever you want. 
whether or not it works is, is a whole different story. We used to, on the trading floor, we would have people call up and say, all right, this is what I want to do, and put all these different legs together, and is there a name for that strategy? Yeah, sure, we'll make up a name for you, you know, if, if you want. Uh, that's no big deal. We'll make up a name and tell you the name, and then we'll call it something else when we're off the phone. Um, like a lot of commission. Right, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's a, you know, it, it's a good point. Commission, uh, the thing that Kevin brought up about commission, it's a good point because while we, you know, really don't get into the weeds about commissions, the more legs you trade, obviously the more commissions there is going to be, number one. Number two, to manage that position, you know, if something goes wrong and you need to trade out of it, if you need to manage it, number one, it's going to cost you more to do so because now you've got another position to trade out of. You paid two commissions to get in, may, now maybe you might pay two to get out, or you might pay four to manage, right? No, number one. Number two, the more moving parts that you have, the more complex things get, the, more, the harder things get. It's so much easier to manage a long call, you know, one option, than it is, say, an iron condor where you've got four. So the more things that you throw at it, the more legs that you add on to it. We've got a guy that emails us regularly, and he starts with position A, then he says, well, what if I add position B to it, and then I add position C, and then I add three of position D, and, you know, next thing you know, it's, it's like, what are you even trying to accomplish, and where did you start, and now you've got all these moving parts that anything can go wrong, plus you're paying a fortune in commissions to apparently useless people like me. <laughs> so, you're taking uh, that you the know, wrong way. It's, it's, <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this outside. Um, you know, so the point being is, you know, can you do it that way? Absolutely. Um, do you necessarily want to? I, I don't think so. Uh, we got time for one more? Marianne, one more? Hang on. Let, let's, let's let the youth speak. This guy over here. Oh, absolutely. Shopping. Let's talk Bitcoin. I'm just oh. kidding. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the question for the people online is um, kind of a, a function of size of portfolio. Uh, if I have a relatively small portfolio, are options still appropriate? Is that pretty much what you're saying? A appropriate to hedge. Okay, and if I can only afford 15 shares of Apple, can I trade options around that as a hedge? The short answer there is... No, because every option controls how many shares of stock. Okay. So you have an imbalance there and the wrong way. Now, if you own 150 shares of stock and sell one option, you're imbalanced in a risk-appropriate way. So the short answer is no. When you framed it as, can I use it as a hedge? Because I need to own 100 shares of something to use options as a hedge. Would you disagree? No, absolutely. That's uh, absolutely correct. Uh, the, the, the only alternative that I would see is using a understanding that Apple plays a huge role in the S&P 500 would be replacing that. And, but... To your point about understanding it young, cheers to you, because the bigger lesson here is the time value of money. Putting money away, saving, and investing today will, there's probably a handful of people out here that will back me up on this one. The earlier you get started, the better. So thinking about it uh, and doing so in a way that is measured, not how can I get rich quick. How can I make my money grow in, in an appropriate way? So hats off to you as far as that goes. Overall, and I, I don't know if the online audience is going to cut off or not. Short? Okay. So we, we threw, and this will just wrap up for me and, and Mark can do the same. We threw a lot, a lot at you today. And... I put up my, my email over here, and chances are you're going to forget 80% of this when you leave here, okay? And that is normal. We need to reinforce things. Feel free. It keeps me in work, 
So feel free to send your questions, and I will do my best to answer them in an appropriate manner. Mark is going to leave you his number, and he appreciates <laughs> late night calls. Okay? Um, but thank you. Please fill out the surveys. Let us know. We can't stay here all afternoon, so do make use of the email. To those online, fill out your surveys, and, and thank you all for coming. And, and just, uh, just really quick, again, I want to thank you. I just want to reiterate what Kevin was saying. We really appreciate you guys spending your morning with us. Um, we will be here for questions for a short time, so feel free. Have at it. So after the online audience, I do have a quick poll. I do this because I get in front of some colleagues.